Welcome everyone. I'm Blake from Sealbox.com. I'm joined today with Eric Vaughn from Richland Rum. Hey, so Blake. we are at the Brunswick location, the second location of Richland Rum. Um, so you know you may have seen the products on the site. We did a barrel pick of one of their rums, a cast strength, a little over a four-year-old rum. Um, so we're going to learn more about their rum, um, about the process, what makes them different. They're the only single estate rum in the U.S. So welcome, Eric, and uh, thanks for joining me. Great to be with you. Yeah, so I wanted to kind of jump into, you know, how this whole thing gets started. You were definitely in the one of the first ones in the whole craft distilling scene, you know, very early in the process, um, and maybe one of the first and only people making just rum. So what... What's kind of your history with rum? Why that product? And uh, you know, what? How was that decision made? It, uh, the uh, decision was inspired by a grandfather. My mom's dad in uh, Holland uh, was a connoisseur of uh, mm -hmm. rums. He didn't make or trade in, uh, in rum, but he had this huge collection uh, of agricoles, mm -hmm. all rums made directly from fresh cane juice from all over the world. Uh, of course, from Latin America, the Caribbean, but also from Asia. And um, my grandfather used to tell me, rum is distilled waste, <laughs> referring to all the rums made from molasses. And molasses, as you know, is a byproduct of sugar making. Uh, molasses is what is left over after you've made sugar from sugar. Or sugar. And um, um, what is uh, significant is that uh, this was in the 70s, and at that point, when he said rum was distilled waste, 97% uh, of the total rum volume produced in the world was made from molasses, and only 3% was made directly from unrefined cane. Now, four or five decades later, um, that pie is larger, but the tiny little sliver is still 3%. Today, 97% of the rum, of the rum production and the rum volume produced in the world is made from molasses and only 3% is made directly from unrefined cane. And what is significant is that within the tiny little 3% sliver, um, producers of, uh, of agricoles, there are only a handful who not only make the rum from unrefined cane, but actually grow the cane themselves. And that is what we do. And uh, when you do that, your rum is called a single estate rum, made field to glass in one place. And we're still the only single estate rum producer in America. That's interesting. And now, so let's go back on the timeline a little bit. So if, when you got the, the, the farm, I assume, for, for uh, sugar cane, uh, when did all that start? When did the stealing start? And then um, I guess the Brunswick location at the newest edition within the last year or so, is that? That's all correct, correct. that's all correct. Um, uh, we were able to uh, acquire land in, uh, in South Georgia near Richland, about uh, two hours south of uh, Atlanta, mm -hmm. a little bit north of the Florida state line, and uh, have started to grow sugar cane there in the late 90s, uh, 98, 97, 98. I produced our first rum in 1999, so next year, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, that was all uh, inspired by the grandfather mm -hmm. story, uh, an attempt to bring back an authentic rum, an authentic agricole, or an authentic uh, single estate by growing the cane house. And um, frankly, it wasn't intended to be a business. It, uh, I, I just, uh, the curiosity to, uh, instilled by my grandfather was, was still there and started out uh, experimenting. One of those fun side hobbies that just take off. <laughs> and uh, in the beginning making very poor quality, <laughs> a very poor quality product. Had someone with aspirations to be a grand piano, mm -hmm. grand pianist, <laughs> and sitting down behind the piano for the first time and sounding old. Yeah. Uh, that, that's what uh, what happened to me too. And it took years and years of hard work, learning, uh, retaining uh, people, knowledgeable people, distillers, consultants, uh, spending time, a lot of time myself, in distilleries around the world. And um, in the course of time, after uh, five, eight years or so, the product was a lot better, and a lot of people began to ask for it. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> 
Imagine century. you start saying you have rum, it's uh, you, you make a lot of friends pretty quickly. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Which so let's talk about uh, just kind of that whole process a little bit. Most people are probably familiar, at least that are watching this, with the whole bourbon making process. You get your grains, you, you know, you mill them or have them in coming in as almost a flour. It mashes, you distill, you barrel. For rum, is the sugar cane's pressed? Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, in effect, uh, making uh, rum and brandy from mm -hmm. wine is much simpler than making whiskey from a starch. Right? Um, what, uh, what we do is we harvest the cane, uh, crush the stalks, mm -hmm. catch the juice, heat the juice, let water evaporate, and allow it to condense, uh, to reduce to syrup. Mm -hmm. And this is where it gets confusing because the words syrup and molasses are used interchangeably. Uh, rum makers who use this process often refer to the syrup as honey to, okay. to have a, a differentiation from molasses because it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's a different confusing. product. But, but that's what we do and later on we uh, ferment the syrup, uh, distill it using traditional copper pot stills. Uh, we distill it once. There's no repeated distilling. Uh, are very conservative in harvest, harvesting the hearts out of the distilling room, and those are either aged or about 60 days in a toasted barrel, producing a clear or virgin rum, or they are aged for five to seven years, producing aged. And just on the uh, kind of the distilling the heart, so um, if you're not familiar with the distillation, you kind of have your heads, your hearts, and your tails. So most people, you know, to be economically speaking, you want the most out of each run. So it, it costs a little more. So not only are you starting by harvesting your own or growing and harvesting your own sugar cane, you're also taking a pretty narrow cut yeah. in the distillation process, which is interesting. It, it's a very labor-intensive product. I, I had a chance to go out to the fields and see, you know, all the sugar cane growing and your wife Karen said, yeah, and it's all harvested by hand, which I'm thinking, how in the world is that? <laughs> so I imagine those are uh, some pretty hot and long days, but then you're harvesting once a year. So you're basically just supplying your, making sure you have enough sugar cane syrup or honey for the entire year. That's 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 correct. And okay. you know, to jump back to uh, to quality, as it started out as a hobby, um, from the get go, a, a discipline was instilled to never compromise on quality, mm -hmm. never. And that is uh, still what we do today. Uh, whatever time it takes, however inefficient it is, um, it will translate in, in, into price, in, into a high cost on which, of course, we want to make a margin, but uh, we're never compromising on quality and still after two decades. Um, today, uh, harvesting is uh, partially done mechanically. Okay, good. We, <laughs> we, we, uh, we can no longer not go as, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> No, that is, uh, it's, it's become uh, much too much. Too much. But uh, as a sugarcane producer, we're, we're kind of between a rock and a hard place. We're really too small to have large uh, mm -hmm. harvesting equipment, machinery, and everything. large machinery, and we're too large to do everything by hand. So <laughs> a lot of uh, farmers' uh, in, you know uh, ingenuity is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's, it's worth it. One of the main traits needed to be a farmer, I think, is <laughs> ingenuity, creativity, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and now, so that syrup, when you're holding it, is it being held refrigerated or it's pretty stable so it can kind of just sit there and whenever you're ready for, to ferment, then you can kind of pull it and... Yep. Or it, the, uh, the syrup is what bridges us from harvest season to harvest season. Mm -hmm. We usually harvest uh, somewhere between Thanksgiving and mid-December. Mm -hmm. uh, sugarcane is a tropical grass and is not frost tolerant. So we need to, uh, sometimes even in South Georgia, you can have some nights of frost. Yeah. But sometimes you don't. Uh, we can't take any risk and uh, we harvest usually, make sure that everything is in by uh, mid-December. Um, we crush everything, reduce everything to syrup, 
and the syrup, um, we reduce the, the sugarcane uh, juice to syrup with a, a total sugar content of about 80% okay. in natural sugars, in converted sugars. And um, natural sugars are the best uh, natural preservatives mm -hmm. known to mankind. Yes, yeah, yep, as long as it doesn't need to be cooled, as long as you don't expose it to sunlight and and, and a lot of heat, it will start to crystallize and mm -hmm. keep it in. But if you uh, keep it cool and relatively dark, you can keep it for years and years. Which makes it very nice whenever you're talking about, you know, trying to plan ahead of time, which I assume that's probably been a uh, another kind of tricky part of the growth is making sure you're growing enough each year. You know, you had the second distillery open. So are you looking to uh, add more fields, add more, you know, I guess you can't add another season in there, so you have to add that more, true. more more uh, fields and more plants and that kind of stuff. It's yeah, that we, part of the um, group. we uh, have started out with uh, probably a quarter of an acre uh, 20 years ago, 22 years ago. That grew to a third and then to half an acre, and then the frost got it all, and we learned from that, and we had to start over. Uh, today we have several hundred acres uh, yeah. in, uh, in Cain. And, uh, which makes us uh, probably the largest cane grower in, in Georgia. Um, and um, uh, yeah, the planning ahead is uh, is very difficult because, of course, planting and growing the cane takes a year. Mm -hmm. uh, then fermenting and distilling it uh, takes uh, several days. Uh, from there, uh, aging, uh, we age somewhere between five and seven years for the aged product, mm -hmm. never longer, uh, because we only use new barrels. That's something we can talk about separately, but uh, uh, five to seven years. So once you bottle a barrel that is seven years old, the process started eight years ago. <laughs> and <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's easy to make those kind of projections, you know, eight, year ahead, eight years ahead of time. <laughs> it's, it's, it's I can't think of what I'm doing eight days from now, much less. Uh, and also, it makes uh, the start very hard huh? because uh, for years you're producing and not selling. You're adding to your aging inventory. You're converting cash into rum, as my mm -hmm. wife always says, <laughs> and uh, creating this, uh, this this big inventory of rum, which at a certain point, after four or five years, the first barrels became eligible to be yeah. bottled, and uh, so. Also, the start, not only the, the planning ahead uh, process is complicated, but the start, it's a huge barrier to enter. Yeah, and that's what you, I see with a lot of craft distilleries. You know, they, they have really good intentions. They're making things the right way, but at the end of the day, it's a business, you know, and so you have to be capitalized or whatever it is or just be willing to wait on a lot of these products. So Very it's, it's um it's great to see people whenever they, they do wait, they put out a great product. It, you know, usually it's in the reverse. Y'all waited till, you know, after you'd had an aged product to put out a, you know, a 60 day aged product where most people are saying, hey, let's get the stuff quickly out the door. Y'all kind of took the opposite route. Yeah. But I guess that goes back to the whole quality standard. You know, you yes. wanted to make sure it was quality first and then start. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We, uh, we first, uh, wanted to be absolutely sure that we knew everything there is to know, not only about distilling, but also about aging. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you start out building a brand with an unaged product while you're aging inventory and things are not going very well, then you have an even bigger problem. So uh, I decided to flip that mm -hmm. and um, uh, bite the bullet and age first and really make sure that we understood everything we needed to understand about aging. Uh, and then come out later on with an unaged version. And you know, it's uh, it's 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 great because we, we still only make one rum. Mm -hmm. yeah. And depending on how long and how it's aged, you create different expressions. Yeah, which will I want to jump into that as well, but before we do there, let's talk about the barrels a little bit. So yeah. you do new charred oak barrels. Yeah. Um, most people are familiar with that with whiskey, but you know it really just gives a lot of that complexity, a lot of the vanilla caramels coming out. So I assume that was a conscious decision to say, hey, let's let's do this. What went into that decision making? 
yeah, um, uh, just use uh, virgin, brand new barrels only. Uh, those barrels are made of American white oak. Uh, in the beginning, we have experimented with French oak, with uh, Spanish oak, with Hungarian oak, uh, Brazilian. Uh, Every certain, kind of oak. <laughs> yeah, and uh, came back full circle to uh, white American oak. As a matter of fact, we get our oak uh, from Wisconsin. That's where we have had the best experience. It's strictly uh, naturally dried, never kill and dry. Mm -hmm. So also that takes three years mm -hmm. to dry your oak. Uh, and then uh, our barrels are made for us uh, in, uh, in Kentucky, mm -hmm. Louisville, Kentucky. Okay. Um, they're uh, toasted, and they're exposed, to, the inside is exposed to a light fire for a longer period of time. And after that, they're charred, the, the fire is uh, turned up. And a lot of people think that the, uh, that the charring has got something to do, that it influences the taste and the, the color. It doesn't, neither. Uh, charcoal, as a matter of fact, is the opposite. It's completely neutral. It's often used as a filter medium mm -hmm. uh, because it filters out color and uh, it doesn't impart any flavor. Uh, the, char, the charring is a byproduct of heat. What you do is you apply so much heat to the inside of the barrel that it chars and the wood cracks open. You increase the surface contact between the fluid later on and the barrel. That's called char. Yeah. Uh, so it should really be called cracking or something like that. <laughs> yeah, not, uh, not charring. But, it doesn't uh, sound quite as good as char. So. <laughs> <laughs> cracking the barrel, that, that could... Uh... Yeah, exactly, exactly. But uh, strictly American white oak, strictly new barrels, we never reuse them. Um, the metaphor we always use is uh, people say, well, why don't you use used barrels, whiskey barrels? And all bad. Old distilleries and old distilled products use all use each other's barrels. Uh, a, because it's cheap, and B, because it, there's, there's aroma exchange. Mm -hmm. that's, that's definitely true. Um, but uh, we always use as a metaphor uh, making a cup of tea. If you have a cup of hot water and a little tea bag, you can, if you want to really make your cup of tea to your best taste, it's best to do that with the first cup. Yeah, um, your own tea bag. Yeah. yeah, and determine exactly how long you want it in there. If you leave it in there too long, if you leave it in there for 10 hours, the, uh, the tea is going to be black, cold, bitter. Mm -hmm been in there too long. Mm -hmm. If you use a brand new barrel, charred and uh, toasted barrel, and you leave your fluid in there for, in our experience, more than seven years, it's going to be dark, overly oaky. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've made 10 cups of tea, now you need to leave your tea bag in there. If you've used, if you, when you use a used barrel, you need to leave your fluid in there for much longer. Mm -hmm. But you tell the consumer, oh, it's better because yeah. so your cup of tea is excellent <laughs> because the tea bag has been in there for 10 hours. Yeah. I, I don't think yeah. so. Yeah. I, you know, that's, I've always been said or told, you know, older is not better, more expensive isn't better, better is better. You know, you got to find what really makes it good and find, yeah, and balance those characteristics, which another interesting part about what y'all do is it's only single barrel products yep. correct yeah Absolutely. so you know most people they're they're blending different barrels they're um, looking for a different taste profile or, or or a specific taste profile but you all choose a new barrel for each different bottling now is the idea to give the customer something new every single time or you know you're trying to hit somewhat a consistency but maybe new flavors or you know. no um we um we we bottle each barrel always individually. We never blend them. And when often when people uh, see that or visit the distillery or walk through one of the barrel houses, they say, well, how can you assure uh, consistency? And we say, we don't. <laughs> we, we, we celebrate the differences. Yeah. Two barrels filled by the same on the same day by the same still four years, five years later, sometimes can have very nice differences yeah. in, in, in aromas. 
and that's something that we believe you should celebrate and not try to blend it out. Yeah, yeah. That and I saw that even when we tasted the select the private barrel I did was, I mean, you'd have barrels that were a couple of days apart, and one just had these chocolatey vanilla round notes, and, and then the other is just like fruity and yeah. just. You know, had good spiciness to it. And I remember you, you picked a couple of very good barrels. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I had to twist your arm on the barrel. I ended up getting a little bit. <laughs> you know, I did, you, you wanted to keep that one, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we no, but that it, it, was that's the that is the exciting part too. Is it keeps people coming back for more. It's yeah. like, okay, I really like this one. Let me get a couple bottles of it. Um, let's see what's next. So. It's always interesting to see how that plays out. I think we even tasted a younger barrel that was around two years old, and it was just like, amazing. you would have never guessed it, but it was amazing. Yeah. yeah. And, and so you don't want to limit yourself, I assume, to say, oh, well, you know, we, we're going to blend, we're going to fill those all in a big um, tote and blend it up. So no, no, it, it kind of keeps that uniqueness, which, yeah. which is interesting. So that kind of brings us into the next part. Let's talk about the products a little bit. So we know you have uh, the Virgin 60 Day. Um, yeah, yeah. Virgin, uh, Virgin rum. Uh, it, it's it's clear as you as you can see, or it has a slight hue. Now, will those go into used barrels for sixty days, or is that toasted barrel? Toasted barrel. Toasted yeah. barrel. Okay. A toasted barrel for sixty days. Mm -hmm. um, those barrels are recycled. Mm -hmm. We do uh, use them twice, or sometimes three times. Mm -hmm. So then the. the have three batches have been in there in the barrel, and then the barrel is is filled uh, mm -hmm. and permanently and uh, allowed to uh, to age. But this is the uh, the clear rum, and you can, as you can see, it has a, a slight hue. It's not completely uh, mm -hmm. clear, and it uh, has evidence that it's been in wood yeah. uh, for about uh, sixty years. This has a very a very clear presence of grassy, mm -hmm. vegetal uh, notes of, of a true agricole. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful rum. It has uh, uh, won many prizes uh, around the world. This uh, bottle has a Good Food Award sticker at the Good Food Awards uh, in San Francisco annually. Only uh, You only get that when you make something field to glass mm -hmm. uh, that, and uh, are a good land steward to mm -hmm. And then, of course, the, the, the product is going to be good, too. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, which is what I kind of love about that is a lot of these these white rums or virgin rums, it's almost like vodka with, oh, yeah. uh, and that's not what you get in that. You know, you still get a lot of that great, just that sugar cane notes coming through, a little bit of the toast, a little bit of the car caramel vanilla from that, but not, not a little bit. yeah, just, just very little, but man, the only white rum I think I've ever put on ice and just sipped on a little bit, so it's it's very good. And then so the next one would be the um, the old Georgia rum. Okay, well yeah, we're gonna jump ahead to the fun stuff. Yeah, so, if uh, yeah if, if we can do that, yeah, that's Let's, fine. I don't know whether we have a, a regular uh, bottle, but uh, yeah, um, so maybe jumping into this one. Yeah, I, I this, so this is one of the cooler things I've seen a distillery do. So I'll let you explain it, the cask exchange. Yeah, this particular one is uh, the Chateau Elan uh, cask exchange. And uh, very shortly, and uh, well, very brief, uh, what we do is we take uh, barrels that um, have had rum in them for three years and take the rum out, we pump the rum out into a new barrel. Mm -hmm. The empty barrel, the wet empty barrel, goes to Chateau Elan Winery, north of Atlanta, who make an excellent port wine. Mm -hmm. uh, they age their port wine for one year in our rum barrel. The rum barrel will install some of the rummy notes, mm -hmm. of course, in the port. Some of the vanilla uh, notes, caramelly notes will be there. But very slightly so, uh, because there's no fluid. If the barrel is wet, it doesn't, but it means there's it's no, not a lot of residual rum. There's, no, there's no fluid. You don't want to there. send them all the rum. You could keep the it all here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, they age, uh, Chateau Elan ages their port uh, for a year in the barrel and then bottle it. Bottle it. Then we get the barrel back and put 
the rum that has been temporarily stored temporarily for a year in a new barrel, matched barrel by barrel, mm -hmm. back into the barrel, in, into its own barrel that has had port wine in it for one year. And then we let it finish for one last year. Mm -hmm. So the rum in here is five years old, three years in its own barrel, then back into a new barrel, and then finished in its own barrel after it's had poured in it. Delicious. Which I think is just such an interesting thing to do because when we talk about finishes, it's a lot of times you're, you know, people will do it for three to six months, but if you really want some of that exchange going on with flavors, it's got to sit in that barrel. So that the exchange program is really good. And so you did that same thing with an IPA as well. Absolutely. Here is um, uh, a bottle of uh, Terrapin Double IPA Cask Exchange, uh, the Terrapin Beer uh, mm -hmm. Company. Mm -hmm. Yep, in Athens, uh, Georgia. Same program, three year barrel gets emptied. The barrel goes to Terrapin Beer, who have aged a double IPA for one year mm -hmm. in the rum barrel. After that, the beer is kegged and the barrel comes back to us and the rum that it originally contained is pumped back into it and allowed to finish for one year. So the, the exchange of aromas is, is absolutely beautiful. Uh, the heavy gravity beer mm -hmm. gets some sweet caramel yeah, notes. Yeah, you get a little bit of that maltiness, a little bit of the pininess, the grapefruit notes from the hops, which is just... In the rum, yeah. yeah it's, 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 oh. it's really an incredible, it's like drinking two different spirits at the same time, almost. It, almost it is. just uh, has you know, one of the more interesting rums I've tasted. Now, I imagine, is it kind of, you, you got to really make sure, okay, now which rum went into which barrel <laughs> whenever it all comes back? Because... I mean, how many barrels are we talking about with a release like that? Uh, usually the, the uh, releases that we have now are somewhere between 30 and 35 barrels. The mm -hmm. mm -hmm. barrel uh, yields normally 270 to 300 mm -hmm. bottles. Uh, so you're talking about somewhere between 7,500 and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and 10,000 bottles. Yeah. Um, and that's it. It's, it's, it's one release. Yeah. and. Uh, we're doing it again. I was going to uh, say, is there some other uh, yes. projects in the work very similar? Okay. Yes, a uh, second release, um, uh, a barrel exchange with uh, Terrapin will be this fall, mm -hmm. uh, probably in October, okay. um, and um, details to be announced. <laughs> but uh, no sneak peek, gosh. <laughs> no, it is uh, the uh, but uh, the, the rum is is ready technically. Mm -hmm. And over the last uh, several months, we've been testing barrels and tasting it, and it's it's, it's very it's, it's very special. Well, my afternoon is clear, so you know if you need some. <laughs> <laughs> now, so let's go on to kind of the the staple, the cornerstone product. Yep. The single estate Old Georgia rum. Yep. This is, uh, of course, what uh, uh, we started out with, um, uh, and have been making now for almost two decades. Single Estate Old South Georgia rum, uh, and again, all these rums are one and the same, but just different aging technique. Um, this is uh, uh, aged usually between four and five years, depending on when each barrel is ready. There is no age statement on, it doesn't say four years or five years on here, but instead there is a little label with a barrel number mm -hmm. and our website has a barrel uh, tracer, mm -hmm. a pedigree tracer and so anyone who buys this barrel can look up barrel 160 and see exactly when it was fermented, distilled, mm -hmm. barreled and then how many, not how many years but to the day you can find out how long this has been in barrel 160. Which, you know, everyone loves information and kind of to geek out a little bit. So that's, that's perfect for for uh, myself and a lot of my audiences. 
but, you know, you want as much information as you can get, you know, if I can find out it was distilled, bottled, and everything, like, yeah, yeah. I want to know. It's, yeah. It's very cool. And it, uh, it also further highlights, of course, the, the fact that this is completely handcrafted, mm -hmm. uh, and it is good for filter glass. But, um, uh, yeah, and what we're beginning to see more and more is that uh, people track tasting notes mm -hmm. of certain barrels uh, and uh, are trying to match those, find other barrels that are comparable, etc. So it becomes a hunt at that point to, to yes. find. <laughs> yeah. Well, very cool. We'll, we'll keep you too much longer. Anything else you'd like to add about the process, bottlings, any upcoming events? Um, if anybody's in the Brunswick or Richland area, definitely stop by the distilleries. Um, any, any last notes? Well, uh, yeah. Oh, I forgot one product. Yeah, one, absolutely. One last one. Um, is uh, the same. Uh, this is the uh, the standard uh, South uh, single estate Old South Georgia rum, mm -hmm. or classic, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, but uh, bottled at uh, cask strength. This one is uh, uh, from barrel two twenty eight, and was. Uh, is uh, been bottled at 105.13 hmm. proof. Now, what what proofers are going into the barrel at? Uh, usually, uh, somewhere between 105 and 125. Okay. Straight from yep. the still, mm -hmm. but we still only once, and then, mm -hmm. uh, 105 to 125 over the four or five year period. Period, you lose a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, this one is down to 105. My estimate is that this was originally distilled uh, at 110. Okay. Ish, so is it, is it, and this is going to go back into the production portion of it, um, but is it you, are you usually distilling going straight into the barrel or may no. add some water just depending on no, no, nothing? No. So just straight from the still to the barrel? Yeah. So you don't lose any of that flavor. You, no. you're, not, you're not trying to add any water. No. If you, uh, when you visit the distillery and the distills are running, you will always find barrels sitting right under the mm -hmm. still. And um, assuming it's the hearts part mm -hmm. of the run, have a, a, a funnel uh, bring mm -hmm. the hearts straight from the still into the barrel. Makes the job a lot easier for the distiller. They don't have to move around. You just go straight. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you have to move the barrel. Then you got to move that barrel. Yeah. <laughs> Once it's filled, it's uh, it's yeah. not light. So, well, very cool. Well, I appreciate the time. You know, like I said, I'm excited about uh, getting more products on the seal box from Richland. So, um, you know, if you're watching this, the full line of Richland products will be available from the cast strength to the cask exchanges, the virgin rum, as well as the classic. So, definitely check it out. So, Eric, thank you for the time and. Um, We'll be drinking some more of your rum soon. Thank you so much, uh, Blake. And uh, needless to say, that if any of your clients uh, ever have any questions, uh, please make sure that they can always contact the distilleries. Uh, Rob, uh, Roger Zimmerman is our distiller in uh, Brunswick. Mm -hmm. In uh, Richland, his son, uh, Robbie, is the, our distiller in Brunswick. Mm -hmm. and. Um, if, uh, if people have real interest or want to know some details, uh, all of us are always available to ask uh, to answer questions. That is that is very true. I, I think I've hit up about everyone on your team with a question at this point, and everybody's been very good to get back to me and patient with my questions. So uh, I won't open, open up the floodgates, but no, that's, they are, they're very knowledgeable, so it's good to hear that. So. All right, well, I appreciate it. Welcome everyone, I'm Blake from Sealbox.com. I'm joined today with Eric Vaughn from Richland Rum. Hey, so Blake. we are at the Brunswick location, the second location of Richland Rum. Um, so you know, you may have seen the products on the site. We did a barrel pick of one of their rums, cash strength, a little over a four year old rum. Um, so we're gonna learn more about their rum, um, about the process, what makes them different. They're the only single estate rum in the US. So. Welcome, Eric, and uh, thanks for joining me. Great to be with you. Yeah, so I wanted to kind of jump into, you know, how this whole thing gets started. You were definitely in the, one of the first ones in the whole craft distilling scene, you know, very early in the process, um, and maybe one of the first and only people making just rum. So what, what 
what's kind of your history with rum? Why that product? And uh, you know, what? How was that decision made? It, uh, the uh, decision was inspired by a grandfather, my mom's dad, in uh, Holland, uh, was a connoisseur of uh, mm -hmm. rums. He didn't make or trade in, uh, in rum, but he had this huge collection uh, of agri balls, all rums made directly from fresh cane juice from all over the world. Uh, of course, from Latin America, the Caribbean, but also from Asia. And um, my grandfather used to tell me, Rum is distilled waste, <laughs> referring to all the rums made from molasses. And molasses, as you know, is a byproduct of sugar making. Uh, molasses is what is left over after you've made sugar from sugar. From sugar. And um, um, what is uh, significant is that uh, this was in the 70s. And at that point, when he said rum is distilled waste, uh, Ninety-seven percent of the total rum volume produced in the world is made from molasses, and only three percent is made directly from unrefined cane. Now, four five decades later, um, that pie is larger, but the tiny little sliver is still three percent. Today, ninety-seven percent of rum of the rum production and the rum volume produced in the world. Is made from molasses, and only three percent is made directly from Monday. And what is significant is that within the tiny little three percent sliver, um, producers of, uh, of high grade colds, there are only a handful who not only make the rum from Monday Fine King, but actually grow the cane themselves. And that is what we do. And uh, when you do that, your rum is called a single estate rum, made field to glass and one place, and we're still the only single state rum producer in America. It's interesting. And now, so let's go back on the timeline a little bit. So, if, when you got the, the, the arm, I assume, for, for uh, sugar cane, uh, when did all that start? When did the stealing start? And then, um, I guess the Brunswick location is the newest edition within the last year or so. Is that That's all correct. correct. That's all correct. Um, uh, we were able to uh, acquire land in, uh, in South Georgia, near Richland, about uh, two hours south of uh, Atlanta, a little bit north of the Florida state line, and uh, I started to grow sugar cane there in the late 90s, uh, 98, 97, 98. I produ produced our first rum in 1999, so next year, 20 years ago. Um, that was all uh, inspired by the grandfather of the story. Uh, an attempt to bring back an authentic rum, an authentic agricultural, or an authentic uh, single estate by growing the cane house. And um, frankly, it wasn't intended to be a business. It, uh, I, I just uh, had curiosity to uh, instill by my grandfather was, was still there and started out uh, experimenting. One of those fun side hobbies that just take off. <laughs> and uh, in the beginning, making very poor quality, <laughs> a very poor quality product that someone with aspirations to be a grand piano or grand pianist and <laughs> sitting down behind the piano for the first time and sounding old. Yeah. Uh, that, that's what, uh, what happened to me too. And it took years and years of hard work, learning, uh, retaining. Uh, people, knowledgeable people, distillers, consultants, uh, spending time, a lot of time myself in distilleries around the world. And um, in the course of time, after uh, five, eight years or so, the product was a lot better. And a lot of people began to ask for it. Mm -hmm. and the Imagine you start saying you have rum, it's, uh, you, you make a lot of friends pretty quickly. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes absolutely. Yeah. Uh, which so let's talk about uh, just kind of that whole process a little bit. Most people are probably familiar, at least that are watching this, with the whole bourbon making process. You get your grains, you, you know, you mill them or have them in, come in as almost a flour. It mashes, you distill, you barrel. For rum, is the sugar cane's pressed? Is that correct? Yep. Uh, in effect, uh, making uh, rum and brandy from mm -hmm. wine is much simpler than making whiskey from a starch, right? Um, what, uh, what we do is we harvest the cane, uh, crush the stalks, catch the juice, heat the juice, let water evaporate, and allow it to condense uh, 
to reduce to syrup. And this is where it gets confusing because the word syrup and molasses are used interchangeably. Uh, rum makers who use this process often refer to the syrup as honey to, okay. to have a, a differentiation from molasses because it's, it's, it, it's, it's a different confusing. product. Right? But that's what we do, and later on we uh, ferment the syrup, uh, distill it using traditional copper pot stills. Uh, we distill it once. There's no repeated distilling. Uh, are very conservative in harvesting the parts out of the distilling room. And those are either aged for about 60 days in a toasted barrel, producing a clear or virgin rum, or they are aged for five to seven years, producing a and just on the uh, kind of the distilling the heart, so um, if you're not familiar with the distillation, you kind of have your heads, your hearts, and your tails. So most people, you know, be economically speaking, you want the most out of each run. So it, it costs a little more. So not only are you starting by harvesting your own or growing and harvesting your own sugar cane, you're also taking a pretty narrow cut in the distillation process, which is interesting. It, it's a very labor intensive product. I, I had a chance to go out to the fields and see, you know, all the sugar cane growing. And what parents said, yeah, and it's all harvested by hand. Which I'm thinking, how in the world is that? <laughs> so I imagine those are uh, some pretty hot and long days. But then you're harvesting once a year, so you're basically just supplying your, making sure you have enough sugar cane syrup or honey for the entire year. That's 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 correct. And okay. You know, to jump back to uh, to quality, uh, as it started out as a hobby, um, from the get-go, a, a discipline was instilled to never compromise on quality, never. And that is uh, still what we do today. Uh, whatever time it takes, however inefficient it is, um, it will translate in, in, into price, in, into a high cost, on which, of course, we want to make a margin. But uh, we're never compromising on quality and still after two decades um, today uh, harvesting is uh, partially done mechanically okay good <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we, so we can no longer not not as uh, yeah. <laughs> no that is uh, it's, it's become uh, much too much too much but uh, as a sugarcane producer we're, we're kind of between a rock and a hard place we're really too small to have Large uh, mm -hmm. harvesting equipment, machinery, and large machinery, and we're too large to do everything by hand. So mm -hmm. a lot of uh, farmers, uh, in, you know, uh, ingenuity is uh, yeah, that's, is, is, is important. One of the main traits needed to be a farmer, I think, is uh, <laughs> ingenuity, creativity, Correct. all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and now, so that syrup, when you're holding it, is it being held refrigerated, or it's pretty stable, so it can kind of just sit there and whenever you're ready for, to ferment, then you can kind of pull it and yeah. work it. The, uh, the syrup is what bridges us from harvest season to harvest season. Mm -hmm. We usually harvest uh, somewhere between Thanksgiving and mid-December. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, we came as a tropical grass and it's not frost tolerant. So we need to, uh, sometimes even in South Georgia, you can have some nights of frost. Yeah. But sometimes you don't. Uh, we can't take any risk in there. Uh, we harvest usually make sure that everything is in by uh, mid December. Um, we crush everything, reduce everything to syrup, and the syrup um, we reduce the, the sugarcane uh, genes to syrup with a, a total sugar content of about eighty percent okay. in natural sugars, in converted sugar. And um, natural sugars are the best. Uh, natural preservatives yeah. known to mankind. Yep, it. yeah, it's law and it doesn't need to be cooled as long as you don't expose it to sunlight and, and, and a lot of heat it will start to crystallize. Mm -hmm. and but if you uh, keep it cool and relatively dark, you can keep it for years and years. Which makes it very nice whenever you're talking about, you know, trying to plan ahead of time, which I assume has probably been a, uh, another 
the tricky part of the growth is making sure you're growing enough each year. You know, you had the second distillery open. So are you looking to add more fields, add more, you know, I guess you can't add another season in there. So you have to add a, more, more, more uh, fields and more plants and that kind of stuff. It's yeah, we, part of the group. Um, we uh, have started out with uh, probably a quarter open acre and 20 years ago, 22 years ago. That grew to a third and then to half an acre, and then the frost got it all, and we learned from that, and we had to start over. Uh, today we have several hundred acres in, in, uh, in Cain, and, uh, which makes us uh, probably the largest cane grower in, in Georgia. Um, and um, uh, yeah, the planning ahead is, uh, is very difficult because, of course, planting and growing the cane takes a year. Uh, then fermenting and distilling it uh, takes uh, several days. Uh, from there, uh, aging, uh, we age somewhere between five and seven years for the aged product, never longer, uh, because we only use new barrels, something we can talk about separately, but uh, uh, five to seven years. So once you bottle a barrel that is seven years old, the process started eight years ago. <laughs> and <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's easy to make those kind of projections, you know, eight, year ahead, eight years ahead of time. It's, it's, it's <laughs> I can't great. think of what I'm doing eight days from now, much less. Uh, and also, it makes uh, the start very hard right? because uh, for years you're producing and not selling. You're adding to your aging inventory, you're converting cash into rum, that's what mm -hmm. you might be <laughs> And uh, creating this, uh, this, this big inventory of rum. Which at a certain point, after four or five years, the first barrels became eligible to be yeah. bottled. And uh, so, also the start, not only the, the planning ahead uh, process is complicated, but the start, it's a huge barrier to enter. Yeah, and that's what you, I see with a lot of craft distillers. You know, they, they have really good intentions, they're making things the right way, but at the end of the day, it's a business, you know, and so you have to be capitalized or whatever it is, or just. Be willing to wait on a lot of these products. So Very it's, it's um it's great to see people whenever they, they do wait, they put out a great product. It, you know, usually it's in the reverse. Y'all waited till you know after you'd had an age product to put out a you know a 60 day age product where most people are saying, Hey, let's get the stuff quickly out the door. Y'all kind of took the opposite route. Yeah. But I guess that goes back to the whole quality standard. You know, you yes. wanted to make sure it was quality first and then start. Absolutely. Yeah. We, uh, we first uh, wanted to be absolutely sure that we knew everything there is to know, not only about distilling, but also about aging. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you start out building a brand with an unaged product while you're aging the inventory and things are not going very well, then you have an even bigger problem. So uh, I decided to flip that mm -hmm. and uh, uh, bite the bullet and age first and really make sure that understood everything we needed to understand about it uh, and then come out later on with an unaged version and you know it's uh, it's 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 great because we we still only make one run mm -hmm. yeah and depending on how long and how it's aged we create different expressions yeah which we'll, i want to jump into that as well but before we do there let's talk about the barrel a little bit so yeah. we do new chart oak barrels yeah. Um, most people are familiar with that with whiskey, but you know, it really just gives a lot of that complexity, a lot of the vanilla caramels coming out. So I assume that was a conscious decision to say, "Hey, let's let's do this." What went into that decision making? Yeah, um, uh, just use uh, virgin, brand new barrels only. Uh, those barrels are made of American white oak. In the beginning, we have experimented with French oak. Uh, Spanish oak, with Hungarian oak, uh, Brazilian, uh, every certain, kind of oak. <laughs> yeah, and uh, came back full circle to uh, white American oak. As a matter of fact, we get our oak uh, from Wisconsin. It's where we have the uh, best experience. It's strictly uh, naturally dried, you know, kiln dried. So also that takes three years mm -hmm. to dry your oak. Uh, and then uh, our barrels are made for us uh, in, uh, in Kentucky, Louisville. Um, they're uh, 
toasted and they're exposed, you know, the inside is exposed to a light fire for a longer period of time. And after that, they're charred. The fire is uh, turned up, and well, people think that the, uh, that the charring has got something to do that it influences the taste and the, the color. It doesn't, neither. Uh, charcoal, as a matter of fact, is the opposite. It's completely neutral. It's often used as a filter medium mm -hmm. uh, because it filters out color and uh, it doesn't impart any flavor. Uh, the char, the charring is a byproduct of heat. What you do is you apply so much heat to the inside of the barrel that it chars and the wood cracks open. You increase the surface contact between the fluid later on and the barrel. That's called char. Uh, so it should really be called cracking or something like that, <laughs> and not, and not charring. It doesn't sound quite as good as charring. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> cracking the barrel, that, that could be... Uh, <laughs> exactly. exactly. But uh, strictly American white oak, strictly new barrels, we never reuse them. Um, the metaphor we always use is, uh, people say, well, why don't you use used barrels, whiskey barrels, if you have all, all distilleries. And all distilled products use all use each other's barrels. Uh, a because it's cheap, and B because it there's there's aroma actually. It's, it's definitely true. Um, but uh, we always use as a metaphor uh, making a cup of tea. If you have a cup of hot water and a little tea bag, you can if you want to really make your cup of tea to your best taste. It's best to do that with the first cup. Yeah, um, your own tea bag. Yeah. And determine exactly how long you want it in there. If you leave it in there too long, if you leave it in there for 10 hours, the, uh, the tea is going to be black, cold, bitter. Mm -hmm. It's been in there too long. Mm -hmm. If you use a brand new barrel, charred and uh, toasted barrel, and you leave your fluid in there for an hour, it's been more than seven years, it's going to be dark, overly oaky. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've made 10 cups of tea, now you need to leave your tea bag in there. If you use, if you when you use a used barrel, you need to leave your fluid in there for much longer. But you tell the consumer, oh, it's better because yeah. so your cup of tea is excellent <laughs> because the tea bag has been in there for ten hours. Yeah, right. Right. You know that's I've always been said or told. You know, older is not better. More expensive isn't better. Better is better. You know, you gotta find what really makes it good and find, yeah, and balance those characteristics. Which another interesting part about what y'all do is it's only single barrel products, yep. correct? Yeah. Yes. So you know, most people they're they're blending different barrels. They're um, looking for a different taste profile or, or or a specific taste profile. But you all choose a new barrel for each different bottling. Now. Is the idea to give the customer something new every single time, or you know, you're trying to hit somewhat of consistency, but maybe new flavors? Or you know. no, um, we um, we we bottle each barrel always individually. We never blend them, and we're often when people uh, see that or visit the distillery or walk through one of the barrel houses, they say, "Well, how can you assure uh, consistency?" And we say, "We don't." <laughs> we, we, we celebrate the differences. Yeah. Two barrels filled by the same on the same day by the same still four years, five years later sometimes can have very nice differences yeah. in, in, in aromas. And that's something that we believe you should celebrate and not try to blend it out. Yeah, yeah. That and I saw that even when we tasted this like the private barrel I did was I mean, you'd have barrels that were a couple of days apart, and one just had these chocolatey, vanilla, round notes, and, and then the other is just like fruity and just, you know, had good spiciness to it. And I remember you, you picked a couple of very good barrels. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I had to twist your arm on the barrel, I ended up getting a little bit. <laughs> you, know, I did, you, you wanted to keep that one, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. Well, well, that, one it, so that's the, that is the exciting part, too, is. It keeps people coming back for more. It's like, okay, I really like this one. Let me get a couple bottles of it. Um, let's see what's next. So it's always interesting to see how that plays out. I think we even tasted a younger barrel that was around two years old, and it was just like, I mean, you would have never tasted it, but it was amazing. 
yeah. And so you don't want to limit yourself by assuming to say, oh, well, you know, we, we're going to blend, we're going to throw those all in a big um, tote and blend it up. So, no, no, it, it kind of keeps that uniqueness, which, which is interesting. So that kind of brings us into the next part. Let's talk about the products a little bit. So we know you have uh, the Virgin 60-day. Um, yeah, yeah. Virgin, uh, Virgin rum. Uh, it, it's it's clear as you as you can see, or it has a slight hue. Now, will those go into used barrels for sixty days, or is that toasted barrel? Toasted barrel. Toasted barrel. Yeah. A toasted barrel for sixty days. Mm -hmm. um, those barrels are recycled. Mm -hmm. We do uh, use them twice, or sometimes three times. Mm -hmm. So then the, the have three batches have been in there in the barrel, and then. The barrel is, is filled uh, and permanently and uh, allowed to uh, to age. But this is the uh, the clear rum, and you can, as you can see, it has a, a slight hue. It's not completely uh, mm -hmm. clear, and it uh, has evidence that it's been in the wood yeah. uh, for about uh, 60 years. This has a very a very clear presence of grassy vegetable. Uh, notes of, of a true agricole. It's a beautiful rum. It has uh, uh, won many prizes uh, around the world. This bottle uh, has a Good Food Award sticker. The Good Food Awards uh, in San Francisco annually. Only uh, you only get that when you make something field to glass mm -hmm. uh, and uh, are a good land steward too. And then of course the, the, the product is yeah, good too. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, which is. What I kind of love about that is a lot of these these white rums and virgin rums, it's almost like vodka with, yeah. with, and that's not what you get in that. You, know, you still get a lot of that great, just that sugar cane notes coming through, a little bit of the toast or the caramel vanilla from that, but not, not mm -hmm. yeah, just, just very little. But man, the only white rum I think I've ever put on ice and just sipped on a little bit, so. It's it's very good, and then so the next one would be the um, the old Georgia rum. Okay, well, yeah, we're going to jump ahead to the fun stuff. Yeah, yeah. If, uh, yeah. If, if we can do that, yeah, that's Let's, fine. I don't know whether we have a, a regular uh, bottle, but yeah, um, so that maybe jumping into this one. Yeah, I, I, this, so this is one of the cooler things I've seen a distillery do. So I'll let you explain it. The cask cask exchange. Yeah, this particular one is uh, the Chateau Elan uh, cask exchange, and uh, very shortly, and uh, very brief, uh, what we do is we take uh, barrels that um, have had rum in them for three years, and take the rum out, we pump the rum out into a new barrel. The empty barrel, the wet empty barrel, goes to Chateau Elan Winery, north of Atlanta, who make Excellent port wine. Mm -hmm. uh, they age their port wine for one year in our rum barrel. The rum barrel will install some of the rummy notes, of course, in the port. Some of the vanilla uh, notes, caramel notes will be there, but very slightly so uh, because there's no fluid. If the barrel is wet, it doesn't, but it means there's no, not a lot of residual rum. No, there's no. Food. You don't want to send them all the rum. You can keep it all here. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, they age uh, Chateau Elan ages their port uh, for a year in the barrel, and then bottle, bottle. Then we get the barrel back and put the rum that has been temporarily stored, temporarily for a year in the new barrel, matched barrel by barrel, back into the barrel. In, into its own barrel that has had port wine in it for one year. And then we let it finish for one last year. Mm -hmm. So the rum in here is five years old, three years in its own barrel, then back into a new barrel, and then finished in its own barrel after it's had port in it. Delicious. Which I think is just such an interesting thing to do because when we talk about finishes, it's a lot of times you're, you know, people will. Do it for three to six months, but if you really want some of that exchange going on flavors, it's got to sit in that barrel. So that the exchange program is really good, and so you did that same thing with an IPA as well. Absolutely. Here is um, uh, a bottle of 
uh, Terrapin double IPA cask exchange, uh, the Terrapin beer uh, number, uh, yep, in Athens, uh, Georgia, same program, three year barrel, gets emptied. The barrel goes to Terrapin beer, who have aged a double IPA for one year in the rum barrel. After that, the beer is kegged and the barrel comes back to us and the rum that it originally contained is pumped back into it and allowed to finish for one year. So the, the exchange of aromas is, is absolutely beautiful. Uh, the heavy gravity beer gets some sweet caramel in yeah, You get a little bit of that maltiness, a little bit of the Tiny grapefruit notes from the hops, which is just in the rum. Yeah, yeah it's it's, it's, all, it's really an incredible. It's like drinking two different spirits at the same time, almost. It's, almost it's just uh, yeah. has yeah, one of the more interesting rums I've tasted. Now, I imagine is it kind of you, you got to really make sure. Okay, now which bar rum went into which barrel <laughs> whenever it all comes back? Because I mean, how many barrels are we talking about with the release? Like that? Uh, usually, the, the uh, releases that we have now are somewhere between 30 and 35 barrels. The barrel uh, yields normally 270 to 300 bottles. Uh, so you're talking about somewhere between 7,500 and, uh, and, and 10,000 bottles. Yeah. Um, and that's it. It's, it's, it's one release and we're doing it again. I was going to say, is there some other uh, yes. projects in the work very similar? Okay. Yes, a uh, second release, um, uh, a barrel exchange with uh, Terrapin will be this fall, uh, probably in October, uh, and uh, details to be announced, <laughs> but uh, no sneak peek, guys. <laughs> no, it is, uh, the, uh, but, uh, the rum is, is ready, technically, and over the last uh, several months we've been testing barrels and tasting it. It's, it's very, it's, it's very special. Well, my afternoon is clear, so you know if you need some. <laughs> <laughs> now, so let's go on to kind of the, the staple, the cornerstone product. Yep. The single estate old Georgia rum. Yep. This is, uh, of course, what uh, we started out with, um, uh, and have been making now for almost two decades. Single estate old South Georgia rum, uh, and again. All these rums are one and the same, but just different aging technique. Um, this is uh, aged usually between four and five years, depending on when each barrel is ready. There is no age statement on, it doesn't say four years or five years on here, but instead there is a little label with a barrel number, and our website has a barrel a tracer, a pedigree tracer. And so anyone who buys this barrel can look up barrel 160 and see exactly when it was fermented, distilled, barreled, and then how many, not how many years, but to the day you can find out how long this has been in barrel 160. Which you know, everyone loves information and kind of to geek out a little bit so that's, that's perfect for for uh, myself and a lot of my audiences you know you want as much information as you can get you know if i can find out it was distilled bottled and everything like yeah, yeah i want to know yeah it's very cool and it's uh, it also further highlights of course the, the fact that this is completely handcrafted in, in this case for paper glass but um uh, yeah, and what we're beginning to see more and more is that uh, people track tasting notes mm -hmm. of certain barrels uh, and uh, are trying to match those, find other barrels that are comparable, etc. It becomes a hunt at that point to, to yes. find. <laughs> yeah. Well, very cool. Well, we'll won't keep you too much longer. Anything else you'd like to add about the process, bottling, any upcoming events? Um, if anybody's in the Brunswick or Richmond area, definitely stop by the distilleries. Um, any any last notes? Well, uh, yeah. oh, I forgot one product. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, 
is uh, the same. Well, this is the, uh, the standard uh, South uh, single state of South Georgia rum mm -hmm. or classic, mm -hmm. so to speak, um, but uh, bottled at uh, cask strength. This one is uh, uh, from barrel 228 and was uh, is uh, been bottled at 105.13 proof. Now, what what proof is going into the barrel at? Uh, usually uh, somewhere between 105 and 125. Okay, stay from the still. Mm -hmm. And we distill only once, and uh, 105 to 125 over the four or five year period, period you lose a little bit. Um, this one is down to 105. My estimate is that this was originally distilled uh, at 110. Okay. Ish, 110. So is it? Is it and this is going to go back into the production portion of it, um, but is it you, are you usually distilling going straight into the barrel or may no. add some water just depending on no. nothing? No. So just straight from the still to the barrel? Okay. So you don't lose any of that flavor? You're, no. not, you're not trying to add any water? No. Like, if you, uh, when you visit the distillery and uh, the stills are running, you will always find barrels sitting right under the mm -hmm. still. And, um, Assuming it's the hearts part mm -hmm. of the run, have a, a, a funnel bringing mm -hmm. the hearts straight from the still into the run. Makes the job a lot easier for the distiller. They don't have to move around and you just go straight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to move the barrel. Then you got to move that barrel. Yeah. <laughs> Once it's filled, it's, uh, it's yeah. not light. So. Well, very cool. Well, I appreciate the time. You know, like I said, I'm excited about uh, getting more products on the seal box from Richland. So. Um, you know, if you're watching this, the full line of Richland products will be available from the cast drink to the, the cask exchanges, the virgin rum, as well as the classics. So definitely check it out. So Eric, thank you for the time, and um, we'll be drinking some more of your rum soon. Thank you so much, Blake. Uh, and uh, needless to say that if any of your clients uh, ever have any questions, uh, please make sure that they can always contact the distilleries. Uh, work with a Roger Zimmerman is our distiller in Brunswick. Mm -hmm. In uh, Richland, his son, uh, Robbie, is the, our distiller in Brunswick. Mm -hmm. And um, if, uh, if people have real interest or want to know some details, uh, all of us are always available to answer, to answer questions. That's, that is very true. I, I think I've hit up about everyone on your team with a question at this point, And everybody's been very good to get back to me and patient with my questions. So. Uh, I won't open, open up the floodgates, but no, that's, they are, they're very knowledgeable, so it's good to hear them. So. All right, well, I appreciate it.